Timothy chapter 4. It's going to be our last uh, message in 2 Timothy here, Lord willing. Um, I'm going to read verse 9 and 10, and then uh, we will, and I just want to read the rest of the chapter. We will read the rest of the chapter, but we'll read verses 9 and 10, go to the Lord in prayer, and then jump back into the, uh, the rest of the chapter here. Verse 9 here says, Do thy diligence to come to me short, or to come shortly unto me. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Cretans to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the privilege here this morning of opening your word and spending some time here looking at the, the, the need for help, the need for partners and companions in the ministry, Lord. We pray, Father, that uh, you just just help us, Lord, to uh, take this and apply it to our lives and use it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this morning, we're not really dealing with uh, precepts or, com or, or commandments, but we're dealing more with a matter of principle, a matter of what, uh, what we see happening in Paul's life. And then we see kind of a theme of this throughout Paul's life. Um, and so I'm, I'm just going to read here from verses 9. Remember, the, the, don't forget the context of the book of 2 Timothy. Remember that he's, he's giving some last uh, or end of life uh, advice and commands and instruction to Brother Timothy as he's about to head off to glory. And so uh, this is uh, one of the last books that Brother Paul writes. Uh, in fact, the book of Titus was written sometime before this, uh, sometime after the, um, uh, his first imprisonment and before his second imprisonment. So, um, you have to wait till after for that. Sorry. <laughs> um, that way, you know, you have everybody okay and all that stuff. Um, so, as he, as he begins, no, no big deal. As he begins to, um, uh, our, our brother here is from uh, Norway. Um, and so, anyways, uh, um, as we as we look here uh, at Second Timothy, let's not leave the context. But I want to just kind of, as he wraps up, he's bringing up the point of basically, I need people with me. Um, as uh, as a young man in the ministry, I have always wanted to have somebody with me when I do things. In fact, my my pastor used to say. Man, you got like, uh, what, what was it he called it, uh, codependency issues or something. Well, not really, because it doesn't matter who's with me as long as somebody's with me, right? Um, and, I, you know, I never really tied that to a scriptural principle until uh, until I got out into the ministry on my own, so to speak, as they sent me to start the church. And then I, I began to look at uh, what Jesus did. Remember when he ordained 70 and sent them out? What did he do? He sent them one at a time, right, all by themselves, and no, oh, he sent them two and two, right? So they had a companion, right? Well, what is it that, and, and I'm, I'm telling you, I studied, I prepared this message, and then like, in between Sunday school and Sunday morning, the Lord was like, what about this passage? What about that? And I'm like, oh, man, i to find those. And, uh, and then just now, I thought of another one that I wasn't even thinking about, but in Ezekiel, not Ezekiel, Ecclesiastes, in Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon says two are better than one. Right? Uh, somebody find that. Tell me where it is, Brother Brian. Why don't you find that for me, and we'll we'll jump over there. But but basically, what he's he's dealing with here, as he begins wrapping up, he says, "Do thy diligence to come uh, shortly to, unto me." In other words, he's saying, "Hey, Timothy, come to me." Why? Well, for a number of reasons, he's going to say here. He needs some supplies. He needs the companionship. He needs uh, another brother to encourage him in the Lord. He says, "For." Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Uh, Demas here is one that forsook, and I believe, as, as it's saying here, for, for the wrong reasons. He's loved this present world. He's, in, in other words, uh, by the way, Paul is in prison, and he's in a situation where he's about to lose his head, like literally about to lose his head. Uh, and so some that are with him may have been concerned that they would be executed with him. And so Demas, having loved this present world, he may be casting condemnation on Demas, or 
he may be simply saying, Demas right now cares more for his own life than to be here with me. And so he's gone to Thessalonica. Um, either way, we don't have a lot of explanation right here in the text. So um, all we do know for sure is Demas isn't there anymore. And so Paul is one man short. But not only is he one man short, but he says, um, continues to say that the you know, Cretans or, or Crescens, or however you say that guy's name, to Galatia. So he's gone to Galatia. And Titus went to Dalmatia. And so he's all alone with Luke. And so he says, only Luke is with me. On, on uh, March 13th of 2011, uh, we had our uh, ordination and commissioning service at McGregor Road to, to shoot me off here to, to Mountain Square. And uh, Brother Luke uh the evangelist that came and helped us as we got started here um, got up during the fellowship that we had, and uh, he was to speak and say a few words. And he got up and he went to this passage and uh, talked about. And I, I don't remember the whole message, but I remember he said, "Only Luke is with me." And he says, "He says uh, you can say this." He says, "I will be there for you, brother." Uh, and uh, and so, anyways, he's been here and he's been been uh, available for. Uh, in fact, he was out here preaching on the street twice this week already, uh, or earlier this week, and and uh, so he is uh, he's available. But that's not necessarily the, the text. But he says only Luke is with me, and I, I wanted to emphasize the fact that he says only, only Luke is with me. In other words, he's like I I'm kind of it's just me and Luke. And uh, not only is he saying that there's that, that there's a lack of partners, a lack of companions here. But that that one sometimes isn't enough. Rather, two, one companion sometimes isn't enough. Yes, sir. Ecclesiastes. Okay. I'm going to jump over there. Ecclesiastes. I'm I'm like. All right. Ecclesiastes chapter four. Y'all can turn over there if you want. Um. <clears throat> And uh, verse number eight. See what? Let's start at verse seven. Then I returned and saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone, and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother. Yet is uh, there no end of all his labor. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, For whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity. Yea, it is a sore travail. And verse 9 says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe unto him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Good, good principles, right? Good things. Good reason. Good reason to, to go together, to, to work together, to have companionship in labor. Um, let's read the rest of this chapter, and then we're going to jump back to this spot again. He says, "Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry." And Tychicus. Have I sent to Ephesus uh, the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus? Uh, when thou comest, bring it uh, with thee, bring with thee, and the books, uh, but especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be uh, fully known, and that all the Gentiles might, uh, might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me out of every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Salute, Prisca. And Aquila, and so on, Aquila, uh, 
and the household of Anisiphorus. <clears throat> uh, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Do thy diligence to come before winter. Jubilus greeteth thee, uh, and Pudens, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace and peace. Amen. Notice here, though, that in verse number 21, he indicates that there are other people with him other than Luke. So why is it that he said, only Luke is with me? Because he says, right, he says, Eubulus, greeteth thee, and Pudens, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. How is it that only Luke is with him? Luke is the only laborer. He's got other people with him. Luke's the only one that's with him that's working. The others are good brothers, good sisters. They're, they're, they're there and they're faithful, but they're not laborers. They're not, they're not laboring like Luke is. They're not laboring in the work like, uh, like that. And so, you know, even though there may be lots of people, in fact, a, a lot of churches are modeled that way, right? You got one guy doing all the work and you got like 100, 200, however many more. Uh, that are spectators, right? Um, I believe that he's pointing out an importance of having laborers, having companions in the ministry, not just people that are just there, but people that are there to help, to be a part, to, to, uh, to do more than hang out. Amen? So um, we're going to look here and look at the laborers, look at some of the laborers in, in the book of Acts. Turn over to the book of Acts uh, in chapter number 13. Uh, you may remember that in chapter 13, it was when uh, Brother Paul and Barnabas were, uh, they had hands laid upon them, uh, and, and the term that we use today for that is they were ordained for the work, right? And uh, to find in verse, number, in verse number one, it says, now there were in the church that was at Antioch, the Acts chapter 13, verse 1, certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, uh, that was called Niger, and uh, Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, uh, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. We recognize here that God called these men to the work. However, he spoke through the church to separate them. And so they had to be separated by the church. Uh, and in verse number three, it says, And when they had fasted and prayed and laid hands, laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, <coughs> being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Cilicia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And, and we, we find it continues on. But, um, but notice here, that it wasn't one guy that stood up and said, I'm going, guys. No, the Lord revealed to them that, God, that, that his, uh, that, that his uh, call was upon these men to go uh, for, for this work here. The Lord revealed to our church before I submitted to it even that, that we wanted to do something in the inner city, that we wanted to uh, endeavor to, to start a church at some point, and my pastor was waiting for me to submit to God's will <laughs> and say, okay, I'll go. Um, and when I did, though, there was a natural companionship that was wrought, that was made uh, at that time, and that was Brother Luke. Um, and, uh, and he says, I'm with you. Let's go. Let's do this, right? And uh, although uh, he wasn't ordained until about a year or so later, uh, a little over a year later, he was still a companion of the ministry and involved in the work. Um, but we find here, though, that, that uh, they went in pair, but not just them. We find that, uh, that there was another guy that went with them. Notice uh, it says, uh, let's see, it says in verse number five, when they were at uh, Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. Okay, so they had John there to assist them. Uh, and 
the, the thought here, the concept here of having John to their minister, John was not just, um, he, he wasn't necessarily uh, apostolic or, or having authority. He was a servant. That's what that minister there was talking about. John was the one that was there. It's kind of like if you have a military chaplain, you have a chaplain's assistant. Uh, the chaplain's assistant isn't necessarily the one that's doing the preaching, but it's, it's the one that's, that's usually kind of making sure, lining up uh, counseling sessions between soldiers and the chaplain or uh, helping to uh, uh, facilitate in uh, preparing for the services, making sure that hymnals are available and things like that. So, uh, and, and, and Bibles and things, and the chaplain's assistant may handle the offering or handle the, you know, the... Um, the uh, uh, printing materials, and, you know, uh, getting a building or whatever, uh, or securing a room to use to do the chapel service or something like that. So, um, this is John. It is John Mark. Gave it away. <laughs> That's okay. We're going to get there, though. In verse number 13, though, it says that now when Paul and his company, so Paul at this point had incorporated, no, he didn't. Um, if it was the uh, it was uh, the evangelistic association of, pop, uh, of apostle Paul. Uh, no, Paul and his company. So Paul and the group of brothers that were with him, uh, the the group of Christians that were with him, loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. And so this this is important because it's noted here, but then we're going to find later that it's important because Paul took note of that, or Saul, and now uh, now called Paul. <clears throat> he noted that John left them. He departed from them and returned to Jerusalem. Now, notice, though, that it says Paul and his company. So at this point, we don't know absolutely, but we know that, that we have at least... Uh, Barnabas, Paul, John. There may be others. But we find that uh, that John left and Paul made note of that. Because later, when they're heading back through, in uh, chapter 15, if you want to jump in there, you can see Verse number 36, it says, Some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname is Mark. That's why we know that it's John Mark. Um, because he tells us right there, John whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought it not good to take him with them, who departed from them, from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. Um, and it says, And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder, one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. Now, <clears throat> not really going to get into the discussion about all of what was happening there. Um, it may be as simple as Paul saying, John wasn't with us when we got to Pamphylia and, and, and Perga. Um, John wasn't, he, 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 he left, and so he wasn't a part, and so they're not even going to know who he is. So why take him along? Or it could have been as deep as John forsook us. John forsook the ministry. I'm writing him off. I don't know. Some people argue one way, some people argue the other, but either way, it was a contentious matter. Paul said no. Barnabas said yes. And so they split up. Barnabas took Mark. And Barnabas, I believe, was successful with Mark. A lot of people will say, well, you don't hear about Barnabas anymore after this. And so that means God blessed Paul because he was right and Barnabas was wrong, and that's why you don't hear more about him. I don't believe that's true either. Uh, the reason you don't hear more about Barnabas is because you're going to find that uh, believe in next chapter you're going to find that uh, the author of the book was picked up there in Troas the next chapter 
Luke, right? And so did Luke follow Barnabas around to find out what was going on with him? No. He was with Paul. And so he wrote about what was going on with Paul. I believe uh, under uh, divine inspiration that God actually obviously authored this book. We recognize that, but he used Brother Luke. And we find, though, that uh, that that he continues in what was going on with Paul. As you'll notice, it says uh, <clears throat> in verse number 7, they were come to Mysia, um, or after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Then they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas, and a vision appeared uh, to Paul in the night, and there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored. So notice here, he goes from they and he to now we. And that's the way it is for the majority of the rest of the book, because he's with him. So, um, but we're going to back up to chapter 15 there. Paul didn't want John to go, but he knew that he needed somebody. And so, although, yes, we see just shortly later that, that Luke ends up with him, we see that he needed another companion in the, in the ministry, another brother that was going to labor with him. And so, in verse number 40, it says, Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren under the grace of God. And when, and, and he went through uh, Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. Now, the first argument about Paul saying that maybe, it, you, know, you know, John isn't going to be even known with them, he wasn't with us. Um, this is where that argument kind of fails, is because he takes Silas. They didn't really necessarily know Silas either, so um, so it may not have been that. It may have been more that he really was kind of hurt about the fact that John Mark left them. Um, however, uh, you're going to find so as you as you look through the Bible, um, the only one that you see really. Um, the only people that you see really just kind of alone in the ministry oftentimes are, give me an example, prophet, John the Baptist. He wasn't alone very long, though. He couldn't have been a Baptist if there weren't any people baptized. <laughs> right? So, but he was, you know, voice crying in the wilderness, being a place without people, right? He was in the wilderness and, and preaching. And, and then, but then we find that the people come to him, and then, you know, they're repenting and believing the gospel, so he baptizes them there uh, in the River Jordan. <clears throat> but as, uh, as a preacher once said a long time ago, uh, when I was early on in the ministry, you know, if it wasn't for the people, the ministry would be so easy. But if it wasn't for the people, there wouldn't be any ministry. So... People are necessary. Not only are people necessary, the lives that we deal with, that's the whole point, right? To see lives changed, to see people uh, serving the Lord, to see the Great Commission continued in the world, right? When Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth, he says, what? Go ye therefore. Ye there is plural. Go ye therefore. Tell the nations baptize me in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Uh, Keeping them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And that command continues on and continues on. Remember in 2 Timothy chapter 2, when Paul says, The things which you've heard and seen of me, he says, What? To teach them to others, right? And he, he continues that command. He says, Who shall be able to teach others also, right? The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And so you find that this is a common thing. And, and we talk about discipleship in our day, and we talk about the need for discipleship. I agree there's a great need for discipleship. Oftentimes people focus on and focus on and focus on preach the gospel, 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 gospel. Preach it. Kind of like a turkey up here. Gospel, 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 gospel. Preach the gospel. I agree. Preach the gospel. But don't stop there. Fulfill the whole great commission. Get them in a church baptism. Train them. Get them understanding the things of God's word and get them working in the work, in the, in the field. 
uh, have them laboring, uh, bringing in the sheep, and working for the night is coming, and bringing them in. And so this is this is something that uh, that that we, you know, oftentimes we read like an ending to a book like this. How many people think about all this stuff? Paul's talking about. Uh, I'm alone here, or just me and Luke, right? I need more laborers. Basically, that's what Paul's saying. Remember when Jesus said, uh, and I didn't even think about this first, I should have thought about it. I don't know why. But remember when Jesus said, uh, he says, uh, say you not, and I'm, I'm not quoting word perfect, but he says, say you not, there are three months, and then comes the harvest, right? He says, look, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They're white already unto harvest. And he says, pray you therefore, that God would send laborers into the harvest. Fields are ripe unto harvest, right? We, we, can, we can look outside the door out here and we can see that there are thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in this city that need to be saved. And not just saved, but serving. And so we focus on that great commission. We focus on reaching the lost and not stopping there, but turning them into disciples, turning them into serving ministers. And so he says, take Mark. Notice here in verse number 11 of our text, only Luke is with me. <clears throat> take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Something happens between Acts chapter 15. Barnabas must have taken Mark back to Cyprus, I believe it was. Sat him down and said, all right, Mark, let's, let's get started on your training program. Let's make sure that you're profitable for the ministry. Let's get you trained and, and able to be a, a, a good uh, soldier for Jesus. <clears throat> and then here we see years later that Paul, after saying long ago, <clears throat> he departed from us. No, he can't go with us. It ain't happening. And it was so important that it split up Barnabas and Saul, or Barnabas and Paul. And now he says, Hey, get Mark and bring him over here. He says, Come to me quickly and bring Mark with you. Because Mark's going to help. Mark's going to be a, 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 a blessing. He's going to be profitable for the ministry. And then as you as you find he's saying, okay, I sent so and so here, I sent so and so there, I sent so and so there. That's just like Paul, right? He's not leaving them with nothing to do. He's sending these guys off into the work. Sending them off for something with something to do. They're gonna go and and preach in, in different places, and we find that uh, uh, you know, just the same in as we get into the book of Titus. What is it? What's the point of Titus? Book of Titus. Well, Paul says, for this cause, left I thee in Crete, right, that thou mayest, um, that thou shouldest set in order things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. And so again, you, you have Paul preparing a man, putting him into the work, but not sending him alone. He's saying, what's he doing out there? He's ordaining elders in every city, right? Training other men, getting them ready for the ministry. And so, um, I'm trying not to make this just like a Bible study, okay? This is a message. But I want you guys to get the point here. That being in the ministry is something that God counts as, a, as an important thing. And it's not just for clergy, okay? Uh, in fact, I, I believe that that concept, that, that mentality is destructive to churches. The mentality that the pastor does the labor of the ministry, and and then maybe a select few does the labor of the ministry. That that is that is uh, damaging to churches, destructive to churches. Um, the Bible teaches that we're all a part of God's work, <clears throat> and Paul here is saying, you know, although he has these faithful now, it doesn't mean that everybody, you know, is ready as soon as they get saved. You know, oh, you got saved, uh, Elijah, you're preaching tonight. Oh, that's not the way it works, right? It's like, amen, praise the Lord. That's not the way it works. <laughs> I'm not ready to preach tonight. Uh, right? <laughs> and, 
anyways, but the point is, though, that men need to be trained, and they need to be ready. I think I preached last week on the importance of fighting a good fight, finishing your course, keeping the faith. We talked about finishing your course. We talked about what has God called you to do? What is it that you can do in the ministry? What is it that God wants you to do that he wants to keep you for? Well, see here, now what is it that, that God's going to use Timothy for here? Timothy's already in the pastoral role. He's already in a leadership role in the ministry. But it says Paul says, come visit me. And when you come, bring some stuff with you, right? <laughs> Supply the need. And so the, the three basic points that I, that I have today, and this is not a real eloquent message, but the three basic points are there's a need for laborers. I've got probably five different ways I can say that, okay? But there's a need for laborers in the ministry. Number two, supplies are needed, right? What did, what did Paul need? He needed a cloak. Why? It's going to get cold, right? What did he say in the, in the verse number verse number 21? Do thy diligence to come before winter. Bring the cloak and come before winter. It's going to be cold here. Right? But he needed a cloak. What else did he need? He needed books. Especially the parchment. He needed the, he needed the, uh, needed the books and needed things to write with. He needed the, the Word of God. And so, these are things that he depended upon his co laborer, co laborer, Timothy, to bring. Flies are needed now. Uh, remember, as we study through any book of the Bible, any book of the New Testament, that uh, ministry does not come without affliction. And affliction takes place uh, as a common thing. But during affliction, even when your co-laborers in the ministry cannot stand with you, as he says here, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Verse number 16. It says, uh, and, he, and he says, that, you know, basically he wants God to forgive them, not lay it to their charge. But he says, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. And it continued, right? <clears throat> so number three, regardless of what everything, regardless of how everything else is panning out, when you're standing alone and serving the ministry, by the way, sometimes maybe we can add another point there. We'll add another point in between, right? So the other point is sometimes you have to stand alone. It's good to have faithful brothers to help. But when you don't, sometimes you have to stand alone. Sometimes your faithful brothers lose their mind and they either quit on God or or they get some crazy wild doctrine in their head and they start messing things up and teaching the wrong stuff. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes they leave the, the truth of the Word of God or they'll, they'll start entertaining other versions of the Bible or they'll start entertaining uh, other entertainments, and, and they start uh, they start looking at uh, at, at uh, the world around them and say, "Oh, we got a this, or we got a that, and we got a," and, and they they leave off the way of the Lord, and they forsake the help because of differences. Or sometimes you're wrong, and they, you know, God's got to whip you into shape so that you can see you're wrong and, and get things right. But even in those times, the Lord stands with us. Remember what Paul said, what the Lord said to Brother Paul in uh, Romans chapter 8. He said, all things work together for good to them that love God, who are the called according to his purpose. To whom he did foreknow, uh, them he also did predestinate to become conformed to the image of his Son. Right? So all of that basically meaning that whatever happens to us, it's not saying that God just orders that, that God's like, okay, today Travis is going to have a flat tire. <laughs> No, no, that's not that's not what happens. I say, well, today, Brother Oscar's crank sensor is going to go out. It did. Okay. <laughs> okay. See what I mean? But it's not that God likes picking on you. Oh, crank sensor. Well, 
Now, sometimes God does intervene and do those things, but usually it's either cause and effect, right? He didn't change it Friday. <laughs> we'll get that change this week. Um, I hope you're tired of it. Goes flat. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but, but you know what? Sometimes things just happen. Sometimes things just happen, right? Sometimes it's cause and effect. I failed to do this or that, right? We didn't fix the leak on the brakes, so we couldn't stop. Fortunately, we didn't drive it with the leak, so praise the Lord. Uh, <laughs> but you know, we found the leak while it was parked. Um, actually, we still didn't find the leak. We found that it was leaking. Anyways, uh, as long as nobody said it. But the, the point is, these things happen. But when those things happen, God works those things together for good, for our good. What good? Verse 29 there just tells us that it is that we might be conformed to the He works those things. You know, whether, okay, somebody might say, well, you know, if, if a terrorist comes in and he starts shooting people up, does that mean that God planned that? No. But God's going to work that together for good in the lives of those that were affected. How could God do that? Contrail? How could God work some crazy catastrophe like that together for good? How could God take a, a house burning and work that together for good? How could God uh, take a, you know, uh, a, a car accident and work it together for his good? How could God take a flat tire and work it for, for, for good to that person? How could God take a a crank sensor, uh, you know, failing and, and work it together for good. How could, you know, when I start thinking about that, I start thinking about when you're working on it, you're underneath that vehicle and you're frustrated. And then God teaches you patience. God teaches you to trust him. God teaches you, not, not to say that, you know, I've, I've learned a whole lot about Christian patience working on cars, a whole lot about how much I don't have sometimes. And so, <laughs> um, and so we've got to be, Reminded of those things, right? And so, how is it that God works those things together for our good? It may be that bad things sometimes work for good because those bad things reveal to us, like a mirror, that we have some character flaw or that we have some spiritual deficiency that needs to be fixed, that we have some sin in our life that needs to be repented of, or that we have uh, some area of growth that we need to uh, begin to work on. And so, that's how God works those things together for good. Although the event itself may not be all that great, we can thank God because he's going to use that event to make us more like Jesus. Amen? So, running down that trail, at least I didn't run alone. Amen? We had companions. And so, when bad things happen, when difficulties happen, understand that you're not alone. Sometimes you have to stand alone physically, but you'll never stand alone. Spiritually, God stands with us. But notice, though, that he's speaking in the past, and he, he's mentioning someone who Timothy's probably going to come in contact with because Timothy's in Ephesus and uh, the coppersmith there as well. Um, but notice, though, that he's speaking of this as something that took place in the past. And where is he now? Because God's going to, you know, even in the future, God's going to deliver him until, and he's going to preserve him unto his heavenly kingdom. But where is he now? He's now past that point. Isn't it great to look back on trials <laughs> and say, praise the Lord, he brought me through that. And this is what he taught me. That. And so this is what God does. But I want to make sure, I guess as far as the, the matter of, of application. I want to take just a moment to bring some application. What about you? This is a good good question at the end of every message. What about you? What about you? You can even say that at the end of what we talked about in Sunday school, canonicity. What about you? Do you understand the, the concept of, of God providing his holy word to us and and uh, then showing us that it is his holy word? Um, well, it's not. What about you here? First of all, are you working in the ministry? Notice that most of Paul's companions, some of them, 
were already trained. But many of them had trained themselves. Who are you training? If you're a leader in the ministry, if you're a mature Christian, who are you training? Who are you imparting the word of God to? Um, you, you've gone through, say, a discipleship. By the way, as, as we, I, I, I stopped myself and forgot about it on the discipleship thing. You know, the best discipleship is this. All right, now let's work on this car. I'm not saying that working on cars is the best discipleship, but working together. All right, let's go. Uh, let's go visit your friends and see if they know Jesus. Talk to them about it. right. And then oh, let's talk to your family. Let's talk to your brother here. What, how's your brother doing? Right. And then guess what? Then his brother gets saved. And, come on, get up. Sit down. Right there. Let's go. See what happens? We go together. Come on. All right. All right. Turn around. Let's go back this way. Over here. All right. And then we come over here. And we do something with this guy. Now he needs to train. All right. Let's go. Come on. All right. Let's go. Come on. All three of us. Come on. Go over here. Go over here. We're going to get this guy. Come on. All right. Now, as we're going, we go preaching the gospel. We go teaching of good Christian character, right? Teach them to, to walk with God. Teach them to make sure that they depend on the Lord. Uh, reading your Bible when you get up in the morning. Teaching God's faith in prayer. Teaching God's faith in the ministry. All right, let's go, everybody. Come on, let's go. All right, now, tell you what. Let's see, you were the first one, right? I trained you up real well. Now, you take these guys, and you go over there with them, and I'm going to go get a few more. And then I come over here and I get him. And we go. All right, you guys can all go sit down. See, oftentimes, and, and please don't misunderstand me when I say this, okay? I'll explain it. But oftentimes, we'll take a discipleship book and we'll say, here you go. Do your discipleship. Give me a call if you have any questions. Sometimes that happens because we're busy, right? Or sometimes it happens because, like, okay, she's a female, and, well, I'm her dad, so it's a lot easier. But if I wasn't her dad, I can't say, all right, come with me. Wouldn't quite work right. So I've got to team her up with a lady that knows the truth. I say, all right, sister, won't you take her through the, the study part of discipleship while you're also taking her with you? And you know what? It doesn't matter if you're going to the grocery store. Quite a lot of times, you know, I'll call Brother Chuck and Brother Chuck. I'll call Brother Oscar and say, hey, what are you doing today? You want to go to Fort Wayne? He's like, what? Yeah, i got a claim up in Fort Wayne. Let's go. He's like, all right, cool. What's the point? What good does that do him? Well, he's with me. We have good Christian fellowship. And then nine times out of ten, you ask me, what, five or six or ten questions about either a sermon I preached recently or you're looking at something, and, and, and so there's growth, right? There's discipleship taking place as we live. That, what, what did Jesus do? He showed up, and he said, all right, James and John, here's your discipleship manual. <clears throat> Turn to page two. All right. Now, go get three or four of your friends. We're going to have a discipleship class. I'm not saying there's anything necessarily wrong with the discipleship class, and we've done that. <clears throat> but what did he say? He said, follow me. Right? What did Paul say? Follow me. That's how we train people. We're involved in their lives. When I first got saved, and, and or well, when we first got married, not that I got saved, I got saved before that, but even when I first got saved, we would our, our church had it was kind of small, uh, a little bit smaller than this actually, uh, and uh, so 
shortly after, well, there, there was like a church split and things, and then we kind of like started over. And I was just an innocent bystander on that one. But anyways, we, uh, we just kind of started over, and there were like 11 of us, so there were less than we have in this room. And uh, you know what we did? We were with each other all the time. Had one brother, I would see at least, I would, I would be with for at least an hour, two hours, or all day sometimes with another member of our church every single day. Not, and I wasn't the pastor, but I'd be with them. Or I would find out that they're, that, you know, those members are together and they're doing this. Now, not saying that you create these little cliques, you know, or these little groups within. No, but we all together endeavor to help one another, right? The whole point of, you know, in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, where it says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, you know, and a lot of people would say, oh, you know, that means you can't miss a church service at all. Well, not necessarily, although that's a good standard. When the doors are open, be here. But not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together isn't about just being at church. The rest of that passage says, what? Instead, we're exhorting one another. Notice that the purpose of church is not to, not to come and hear a sermon preached, although that happens. But the purpose of church is to exhort one another. By the way, we can assemble together during services or not during services. Remember, we're having men's meeting on or, and the ladies' fellowship on Saturday. And so that is an assembling, although we're not all assembling together you know, as one service, but we're assembling together for what? For the purpose of edification, for the purpose of uh, exhorting one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up, but the, the point here is that the work of the ministry is not a select few kind of work. The work of the ministry is a all the church kind of work. Even the youngest Christian can do something for the Lord. When I first got saved, uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I just saw opportunities to do things, and I did them, whether it was clean the bathroom at church or pick up, you know, I see trash on the floor, pick it up, or junk on the pews, pick it up, you know, whatever, things like that. I just look for opportunities to serve the Lord and then mow the grass and, and uh, make sure the chairs are straightened or whatever, you know. Um, and so, guys, let's not, let's not have a wrestling match over here, right? Um, but there's always something we can do, right? And then as I was, guess what happened? When I was there at the church building mowing the grass, guess what happened when I was there at the church building cleaning stuff? I wasn't by myself. There were other people there too. Because everybody else had the same mindset I did, right? We can all do something. And what happens when we do that? We're all there and we're standing around we're like, hey, what are you doing this afternoon? Uh, whatever. Let's go visit for a little while. Wasn't even visitation time. We just went and visited people. Right? Or, hey, brother, I was thinking about what you preached the other day, and I was wondering, what about this? And then there's doctrinal discussion, and there's teaching going on. And I was just there to vacuum the sanctuary or clean the toilet or whatever it was. The point is, we can all, well, the point is, looking out for opportunities to be a companion in ministry, and then also looking out for opportunities to help your companions, whether it be to bring them a cloak because they're going to be cold, or whether it be to uh, prepare something like you know, the, the building or a meal or whatever it is, or just to hang out with them. Uh, but as I learned in preacher boy class, don't hang out, help out. <laughs> And so if there's something to do, you do it together, right? I went to go talk to Brother Kaiser uh, out at the Gregor Road uh, several weeks ago, and I knew what he was going to be doing, so somebody told me. I knew that he was going to be working on the, um, the building back there that they're building. I, I'm so excited about that building. I remember back in 2007, 2006, when I first started as a youth guy there, and uh, we've, we we uh, we had an awesome youth ministry. I was so excited about it. And I thought, you know what? We're going to run out of space. We need to have a fundraiser. We need to do something. 
try to build a like a, a gymnasium or a like a multi-purpose building. Something we can do to, to take the kids, and, you know, when bad weather comes or whatever, it's cold out, they don't have to go out and freeze. Things like that. We can go play over there, and we're not disrupting other things that are going on uh, on the facility in the facilities. And so uh, we started doing that. That was in 2007. And here it is, 2017. They've got a got a roof, got the ground laid. Of course, you know, the, holding the roof up. And so I showed up, they were putting the girts on, and uh, uh, so I said, hey, how's it going, brother? Got some things I want to talk to you about. Can I help you? So we finished the whole side. We girded, girded a whole side uh, of the building while we just talked about things going on in the ministry and uh, things going on with, with mutual ministry partners and things. And so, you know, that, that's how we do it, right? Be a companion in the ministry and help your companions in the ministry. And know that even when you may feel alone, God's there. God is there to, to strengthen you. But you don't stay there alone. You train others, right? What, what did Paul do after all? Forsook him, whatever? Well, he ended up with others again. When John forsook him, when John Mark forsook him, what did he do? Yes, he was pretty upset. Yes, he said, no, he can't go with me at this time. But he took Silas. He took somebody else. He didn't stay alone. He didn't go off and hide in a corner somewhere by himself. Nope, he took somebody else, and he went to try to change other lives. And he did. What, it, what ends up happening shortly thereafter, you know, we find they go into, into uh, uh, Macedonia. We see the people saved in, in Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea. And then down into uh, Achaia, they get and they get to the Corinth, and and they find uh, Apollos. Well, Apollos over in Ephesus, but before that, they find Aquila and Priscilla, and then all these partners in ministry, right? He didn't quit because he was alone. Don't do that either. Take those things, apply them to your life. Let's pray, Father. We thank you, Lord, so much for your word, Lord. I pray, Lord, even though we didn't really talk much about salvation today. In order to be a worker in the ministry, in order to be a disciple of the ministry, we've got to be saved first. First, we have to be born again. So, Lord, I pray, Father, that if there's anyone here today that has not trusted your Son, that has not uh, has not seen their need for salvation, Lord, I pray, Father, that they that they would realize today that your Word condemns them as a sinner, just as it condemns me, just as it condemns everyone as a as a sinner. We've all sinned and come short of your glory and Lord, I pray, Father, that they would recognize that they need saving from that sin because there's no good works that they can do to get rid of the fact that they're guilty before you. And Lord, I pray, Father, that they'd recognize that you, the only and perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin, taketh away the sins of the world, uh, that you came and you died on the cross, bearing their sins for them. And uh, you were buried. And you rose again the third day for their justification. Lord, I, I pray, Father, that they would recognize uh, that you have done all that's necessary to save them. There's no works of righteousness which they can do that saves, you, that saves them, but only by your mercy they're saved. And, Lord, uh, I pray, Father, that, uh, that if there's anyone here like that today, Lord, that they would turn to you in repentance and trust in you and, uh, and be born again today. Lord, I pray for those that are here that are born again, that are, that are, that are saints today. Lord, I pray, Father, that you just strengthen each of them. Lord, help each and every one to be, uh, to be uh, endeavoring to be a partner in the ministry, uh, first and foremost, your partner. And secondly, Lord, may they partner with one another in, in, in their church here. Lord, may we be effective in accomplishing the Great Commission because we're, we're seeking out not just, not just the pastor, but but each and every member uh, looking to, to spend time with one another and, and find ways to work together in the ministry to reach this area for your uh, for your kingdom. Lord, we pray your blessing now as we go our separate ways. Lord, I pray, Father, that uh, everyone would just take a moment right now. There's conviction that needs to be dealt with. Lord, that they would turn to you and, and uh, repent. Lord, that they would correct that. Lord, if there's a, a matter of prayer that they need to deal with, Lord, I pray that they do that even now. And, and, Lord, that uh, if there's any loss that have questions, Lord, that they would come to me before leaving and, or, or to another brother here. And, uh, Father, they'd not leave here still lost. Lord, we pray your blessing now on all in Jesus' name. 
Amen. All right, you are dismissed.